So hi, I'm Dan Hawkins with NAC, and today we're with Tom Trumpeter, who is the CEO, President and CEO of HealthPoint in Renton, Washington, which is really Seattle for all practical purposes. Tom is in the process of circling Seattle and the SeaTac Airport uh, with his uh, rapidly developing healthcare system uh, in the Elliott Bay and, uh, and beyond <laughs> in that. We welcome you. Thank you. Thank you for uh, coming and sitting here. Tom, you've had a, uh, a long career with health centers. How many years is it now if you go back to St. Louis and... Uh, it's pushing 40. Yeah. Um, I think my, my first work in health centers was actually as a consultant with a little um, migrant health center in Pasco, Washington, when I wow. helped them write their first federal grant application and needs assessment and things like that. And I kept doing that and a couple of other little things for a couple of years before I ended up working for Bill Hobson. How about that? Yeah. Um, and you worked with Bill for a number of years. I worked directly for Bill for about four or five years. Uh -huh. And um, then I went to the Northwest Regional Primary Care Association. I worked for Jane Lee. Good old Jane. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, I placed you in St. Louis. Was I wrong? Were you not in St. Louis no. at any point? No. My I, bad. I grew up in Detroit. Uh-huh. Um, but I've lived in the Seattle area since 1975. Okay. All right. Well, that's my bad. Uh, Shame on you. But you have, but you have been uh, a, a titan in the health center movement here and throughout the U.S. and especially in the Northwest um, in the days since then. Tell, tell me what drew you to the health center movement in the first place. Well, um, it was almost accidental, actually. Um, I had been working for a nonprofit umbrella organization for agencies um, serving the Hispanic community in the Seattle area, and mm -hmm. that was a, actually a CETA job, um, oh, yeah. if you remember the, the CETA old. program. Um, when that job came to an end, one of the folks that I had been working for had just assumed the role of, a, of the director of a sort of newly established migrant health center over in eastern Washington in the Tri-Cities area in Pasco. Uh -huh. And um, my job with the Concilio for the Spanish Speaking had been grant writing and number crunching and stuff like that. And this was at a time in the health center world where medically underserved population and area designations and needs assessments and kind of more serious budgeting um, were really being required. This was the early 80s. Mm -hmm. um, and Ray called me and said, would you come over and help me do this? And so I did. And once I had a glimpse of what this health center was doing and the people that it was taking care of, I felt that this was my heart's calling. And so then I tried to make that happen. <laughs> and your next step after that, that was as sort of a stringer consultant. Yes, I had a couple of jobs as a little stringer consultant. Um, the regional office at the time um, seemed to like the work that I did. So they referred me on to a couple of other um, little gigs like that. And through that, and some other work that I'd been doing as a um, kind of land use activist in the Seattle area at the uh -huh. time, um, I got introduced to Bill Hobson, who was at the time the executive of Central Seattle Community Health Centers. And um, Bill had just received a grant to do strategic planning um, and decided that it didn't make a lot of sense for him to just do strategic planning in a vacuum for Central Seattle Community Health Centers, but wanted to do it for what at the time were the 19 separate community health center corporations in the Seattle King County area. Mm -hmm. um, and he hired me to, to do that work. To hound dog it? Uh, yeah, kind of. Um, and actually, he actually hired me first to do work under the jobs bill. 
if you remember the jobs I bill. I do remember and that. And so 85. my job was to run around in rural southwest Washington trying to find physicians who'd be willing to take care of folks who had lost their insurance because they had lost their employment. Um, that was an interesting um, period of time. Um, Indeed. You, you actually, th though, did create a system where, was it Central Seattle that was the payor? Yes. That paid those private yes. providers yeah, we, we, for the care that they provided. Right. We developed a limited fee schedule based on the Medicaid fee schedule and asked folks if they'd be willing to live with that to take care of people who needed care. And, and we, we were relatively successful in that. There was only one place where we were told to take our scientific socialism and put it somewhere else. Um, <laughs> but in a lot of places, what this did, this seeded the formation of a couple of other health centers in, the, in Washington State. Did it really? Yes, it did, yeah. So, so you were spinning off uh, Johnny Appleseed style uh, new systems of care, yeah. even as you move forward on yeah. that. Yeah. And that's then when, so the, when that job ended, that's when I did the planning work for the networks in the Seattle area. For Bill? Yeah. Okay. And, and then in 1986, I went to work for the Northwest Regional Primary Care Association. Spent with 10 Jane, years there. With Jane Lee. Six years working for Jane and four years as the executive there. Uh huh. Yep. Yeah, that's what Jane went back yeah. to St. Louis. Yeah, Jane was I in St. Louis. I just confused yeah. her odyssey with mm -hmm. yours. <laughs> Jane is, an, is, is still an amazing person and still one of my inspirations, as is Bill. She has retired since she, then, right? She has retired, yes. Yeah, well, next time you see her, tell her, give her my best. I will absolutely do that. By all means. Uh, and Bill, I sort of lost track of him. He was in L.A., but then he headed to Seattle for a while. Well, he's, he's, he retired from Watts as yep. their CEO. He's still living in Los Angeles, but he's making um, trips back and forth. His kids um, are still in the Seattle area, um, and one of his, his oldest son is now making a living as a musician. Um, well, he has, his oldest son has been yeah. a, 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 a phenom. Yeah. Musically yeah. for a number of years. He is. Yep. That's great. Okay. But we're not here to talk about <laughs> Bill Hobson or Jane Leet. We're here to talk about you. So you um, moved to the Northwest Regional Primary Care Association as a deputy to... Kind of. I mean, um, we didn't call it that at the time, but yes. And part of my job there was to help... Um, get started the Washington Association of Community Health Centers. Which didn't exist at that point, right? No, the, um, the only state primary care association that existed at that point um, was the Oregon Primary Care Association, and it, was, it existed before there was federal grant money for PCAs. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, Northwest Regional was formed, and Northwest Regional was actually the initially the recipient of the federal grant money that was then parceled out first to Washington and Oregon and then to Idaho and Alaska as they developed their associations uh -huh. as well. And then as maturation dictates, um, it became time for those state associations to be their own direct grantees and for the Pacific Northwest to figure out what's the rational division of labor between the regional and the state associations. Well, and let it be known that the Northwest Regional Primary Care Association is the last funded functioning regional association. I thought Champs centers. was still around. Ah, Champs, that's right. So we have eight and 10. Yep. The Northwest Mountain States and Northwest parts of the country is the only parts of America that have functioning regional associations. Right. Um, and you were part of the, the lead wave in Region 10 uh, through the Northwest Regional Primary Care Association. When you moved to the piece to the regional PCA, what were, from your perspective, the greatest needs that health centers in the region had and that the regional PCA could respond to? Well, that's, that's a good question. Um, at that time, so much of our energy in terms of where we sought our support was federally directed. Mm -hmm. 
And one of the biggest needs of the health centers in the region was advocacy with the Region 10 regional office at the time, which had a lot more power and influence oh. than the regional offices do today. Um, so it was a, it's, in these instances, it's always the delicate dance of being sort of the, the advocate that tells the powers that be the things that the powers that be may not necessarily want to hear, uh -huh. and also then being a partner with those very same powers in order to leverage good on behalf of both the health centers, but more importantly, with the people that we were taking care of at the time. Mm -hmm. so, and that was, that was the big deal. And, that, and so we were very focused on federal funding, federal policy. Medicaid was a small piece of the pie But at your that goal time. was to develop a working relationship with the regional office. Yeah, you bet. That would benefit both the PCA and more importantly, the health centers. Right. Right. Uh, in the, the four state region. Um, four or five states? Four. Okay. Oregon, Idaho, Washington, and Alaska. That's right. Um, uh, you stayed with that for how many years? I was at Northwest Regional for 10. Oh, that's a long time. Mm hmm. Uh, but then you transitioned to the health center. Correct. Uh, why did you do that? What led you to go from the training and TA source and advocacy source to hands-on day-to-day management? Okay, here's where you're gonna to need to edit things a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought that um, with all of the, not all of, but a great deal of the policy action moving to the state levels, that the kinds of things that we could do at the regional level, to be honest, I'd done them. Yeah. And, um, and I was looking for a new challenge. That's a minor part about it. Um, more is I really did want to get more back into the service delivery aspect of things. Uh -huh. And Jane and I had always had a marvelous working relationship with each other. And um, when she got ready to retire, she called me and said, would you like to renew this relationship? And we, without making any promises, let's talk about making a plan transition. And so I, so I moved, um, both to work once again with someone that I admired and cared deeply about, mm -hmm. um, and the other is to kind of get my fingers into the substance of the work of taking care of communities and people. Uh -huh. um, and um, knowing full well that this was not our decision to make, it would be the decision of the board of directors. Right. Um, and, but figuring um, it was certainly worth a shot and it was something that I really wanted to do. And I never looked back. And when you landed, what did you find your lap filled with? Um, well, all kinds of interesting things. I mean, we were one of the least funded, um, most living on the edge of the health centers in the Seattle area. And um, we probably wow. wouldn't be who, well, not probably, we definitely would not be who we are today had it not been for Jane's acumen in um, kind of coming in and really helping ship the, set the ship aright. Um, and when I came to work at HealthPoint, we, we, had, we had no direct federal grant at the time. Yeah. It was a pass-through grant through one of the other organizations in the area. And our first goal was to get our own federal grant. Stand up on your own two feet. And, yeah. and we did that in fairly short order. Um, and then one of my biggest projects right in the beginning was to bring um, complementary and alternative medicine under the roof at what at the time was called Community Health Centers of King County. Um, and um, what I found was an organization full of spirit um, and not quite so full of resources as we really needed. And so uh -huh. it was our job together to make that happen. And, um, you had to broaden your base of financial support. Right. And, and also, at that time, 
um, we had just begun the um, journey in Washington State with managed Medicaid. And at that time also, we had just begun the journey of the health centers in the state forming their own Medicaid managed care plan. Uh -huh. And so what I found within a year of joining the organization was a wealth of opportunity to, um, to really deepen our commitment to the communities and the people that we serve. Through the Medicaid managed care? Well, not just through the Medicaid managed care, but it uh -huh. played a huge role. Um, the support we got through our federal grants and all of the things that are attendant on being within that framework and the support that we get through the reimbursement mechanism that we have in Medicaid, they all played a huge role in helping us become the organization that we are today. Yeah. Well, and Washington State has been more successful <clears throat> than almost any other state in securing solid support from the state legislature and the state's Medicaid program for the work that you do. True. Uh, and so, and, and of course, the progressive expansion of coverage under Medicaid, yeah. which even preceded uh, the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. You had, you had, uh, we had the basic health plan. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You had a ton of good things going for you in the Northwest, in Washington State. Other health centers took some advantage of that and grew some. Health Point, I think, took maximum advantage of that and grew dramatically. Yeah. Don't you think? <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> when I started in, um, it was 1996. Um, we had 90 employees and a budget of about eight and a half million dollars. And serving how many patients at that oh, point? Gosh, probably uh, 30,000. Maybe yeah. 15 to 20 when we first when okay. I first started. Um, we yeah. now take care of about a little over 100,000 people a year, um, and we have about uh, pushing 900 employees. And, wow. Um, and our budget is a little over $100 million a year. Wow. That but is a great success story. It, it is. It, you know, and, and these are the terms we commonly use. Uh -huh. um, but to me, those are the means by which we are able to do the things that we've always set out to do. It's not about having a big budget. It's not about having a lot of employees. Mm -hmm. It's about being permanent assets in our communities that really have an influence on how people are able to have better lives and how we participate in creating a better world. I remember you talking years ago about the Somali community out by the airport um, and how it really had nobody before you came in, before Health Point came in, and began providing care to the community on an ongoing welcome in your own native language. We've got staff who speak your language. We're committed to serving you regardless of your ability to pay, et cetera. And that whole health center perspective, um, what led you to believe that that was the proper way to organize and deliver health care? Oh, now, I don't want to be glib, Dan, but it's kind of like falling off a log. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, I, I mean, what's always been really interesting to me about this world and the way that we approach taking care of people is that it is much more relational than it is transactional. And we are, and we have to be, less worried about the transaction of who pays whom for what, uh -huh. then we are about the development of a relationship with another human being in a way that allows not just that human being, but, but us as well, to live a better life. And, if, and that, you know, simply put, it means meeting people where they live or where they are. Uh -huh. and, um, and if that's the attitude that you adopt, then, then there's really no choice but to do the things that folks need in order to be able to meaningly, full, meaningfully participate in sure. 
in the collective work that you do together. So, I mean, it's, I, I, I am not naive enough to think that everybody doesn't accept that as foregone conclusion. But one of the joys of being in this world is that we do. Yeah. No, that's true. I, uh, I certainly believe that health centers have been uh, the sort of leading charge to a new health system that focuses on the individual, on the community, on the population being served, and asks what do they need rather than what can they pay for. Right. Um, but when you first got to Health Point, Community Health Centers of King County, um, you obviously didn't have the latitude to be able to do what you're doing today. Truly. What were the challenges that you faced when you first moved there? Um, we had very a very, very tight budget. We were really not as able to pay people what we would have liked to mm -hmm. at the time. Um, I think size was a was a limiting factor. Mm -hmm. um, we were not a, we did not have at that time the economies of scale that um, that both Jane and I really thought we ought to have in order uh -huh. to be able to do the job that we wanted to do as well as we possibly could. Um, and at that and, and the shifting demographics have always been. I, I don't know that, that I'd call them a challenge as much as I'd call them a joy, to be honest with you. Um, at the time, there were a lot of um, Eastern European refugees that were coming into the area. Uh -huh. um, you know, Seattle, the Seattle area is one of the hubs around the country where newly landed people, what we like to call new arrivals, uh -huh. um, I think it's a little bit more welcoming of a term than all the other stuff that's used, yeah. um, particularly by some. Um, and it, we've always been a spot where new arrivals land. And understanding how to work with that, as well as with the community that has been there for a long time, um, sure. has always been you know, one, of the, one of the things that we've had to do. And, and it can be challenging because you have to figure stuff out. Um, but that was, and that's always been part of our fabric, is, um, is caring for new arrivals. And especially in terms of recruiting trained, right. capable, committed staff, right. uh, that had to have been one of your first and biggest challenges. It has been, and and that um, you know we've. I'm happy to say that I think you know as best we can. We've addressed a lot of those challenges over the years. A lot of it is by virtue of um, being a successful business. Mm -hmm but a business is one of these. <laughs> <laughs> of the heart. You got it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so at this point, as you stand on that pinnacle that you have built and achieved uh, to this day, how do you see the future of Health Point, the future of health centers generally? Um, well, um, I appreciate you giving me more credit than I deserve. Um, Health Point wouldn't be what Health Point is today if I didn't have the grace and the benefit of the people I work with. So I, and I, I did not build Health Point. We all built Health Point. How many, how many employees now? Um, almost 900. Wow. Um, and, and I, I know what my role has been, but I, I do want to say that none of us do this stuff alone. No. Um, and that, again, is part of the spirit that lays as a foundation for what we do. Sure. Now that I've gone off on that, I forget what you asked me. <laughs> <laughs> Recruiting staff. Yeah. Retaining staff. Mm -hmm. Finding the committed folks who will... Follow your lead because I understand that no person is an island uh, unto him or herself. That there's got to be many others who do that, but there has to be a leader. And you've been the leader. You've I have. done that. 
So as you went about recruiting and working overtime to retain staff, what did you hit upon as being the best attributes of a system of care that would be successful in recruiting and retaining staff? Um, well, let me answer that in a couple of ways. I think one is, is as basic as the environment in which people work. Mm -hmm. And this is a, um, what I sometimes like to call a constant gardening project. Um, but it is developing an environment that is inclusive, that honors diversity in all of its imaginable forms, mm -hmm. um, and that really seeks um, to be an equitable environment where people are treated fairly and explicitly fairly. Um, that we, we seek to engage with the folks who work with us. Um, we have invested heavily in um, process improvement work, particularly using the lean rubric. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've always liked about lean is for me, the dominant principles are driving out fear and waste and trusting that people who are doing the daily work know best how to improve that daily work. Hmm. I'm not gonna tell a front desk person how best to do their job. Uh -huh. That's not my job. No. Um, and, and it's sheer craziness. Yeah. <laughs> to begin um, with. And, and so really creating a culture in which that's possible really allows everybody to live to their fullest potential, um, creates an environment in which people are happy to be where they are, yeah. which then, and, and I've said this to our new employees, we have a vested interest in taking care of our people and making sure that they're all well treated, not just for the sort of narrow business reasons of turnover is expensive, but for the bigger and better reason that we're in the business of taking care of people. And on the one hand, those folks are people too, and they need to be taken sure. care of. And we can't expect the folks who work for us to take good care of our patients if we're not taking good care of them. Um, so so how we create a community within our organization that feels like a community not unlike how NAC feels like mm -hmm. a community, yeah. um, is, is really, really important. And it is part and parcel of who we are and what we do and how we do what we do. Excellent. Lessons for learning throughout all of that. Um, and you did say you see a bright future I do. for health centers. I do. Um, I think, well, when you look at where we are as a national movement today and where we were when you started and then when I kind of Johnny come lately in that scheme um, started um, mm -hmm. and you look at where we are today, um, I can't help but feel hopeful. It's a different I, world. I really do think that the model that we have represents what the foundation of a rational healthcare system ought to be. We have a topsy-turvy financial economic environment in healthcare in this country. Um, that's, I hope someday will sort itself out, um, but we represent an alternative to that that, that is viable. We've seen so many attempts with, you know, different kinds of concierge and boutique medicine that, you know, at some levels, talk the talk that we talk, mm -hmm. um, they but they fail. The walk. They fail, and and they fail for a lot of reasons mm -hmm. um, that we have surmounted by virtue of who we are and how we approach what we do. But let me ask you one question, because you've been you you are one of the most thoughtful people I, I have ever worked with, and that I find tremendously helpful to me. Um, you said that we are relational, not transactional. 
But the payment system that we work off of is purely transactional. It's a per visit payment. We want to get away from that, but getting to a relational payment model that relates more to our relationship with the individual and the family mm -hmm. and the community we serve has proven to be vexing, um, hard to grasp, hard to figure out how to do. How do we move from today's PPS to tomorrow's whatever it's going to be, they call it value-based payment or whatever, uh -huh. without sacrificing uh, the special protections that are there for health centers in the PPS today? <laughs> That's a work session, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what I firmly believe is that what, what PPS, the benefit that PPS has delivered has been more or less to make the primary care portion of the Medicaid program more or less actuarially sound. Mm -hmm. It is not a bonus payment. It's not right. overpayment. It is simply that it has at least laid a more or less actuarially sound primary care base within the Medicaid um, program the for health yeah. centers. There, there are ways to translate that devotion of resources to primary care into global capitation uh -huh. models. I'm, I live within one. Um, and the more we can move towards Owning our own data, yeah. documenting our own outcomes, and using that information to guide how we further develop the work that we do mm -hmm. is, is the path that I see going forward. Um, but I also think, and, and I know I say this from a standpoint of privilege, from the environment that I'm in, but um, I really firmly believe this means that more health centers need to own their own managed Medicaid, HMOs, managed care mm -hmm. organizations, whatever you want to call them, um, and they need to control the resources more directly than they do right now. Um, and I know we've had lots of support from some of the national for-profits, but come the end of the day, um, that's an interim step to doing something that is more robust. In our own hands. And more self-directed, more self-fulfilling, and a way to deepen our commitment to what we do. Yeah. In Washington State right now, the Medicaid program has rolled behavioral health, substance use disorder, um, and mental health services into the capitation rates that are paid under the medical portion of the Medicaid program. I fully expect that dental care will be rolled into that mix within the next three to five years. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we're wrestling with right now is um, how we meaningfully define what, um, for lack of a better term right now, a year of care looks like for one particular set of our patients mm -hmm. with generalizable um, lessons learned. Uh, which will lead us to understand how we need to engage with our patients in a different way than the, than the transactional pay me for a 99213 right. um, system works today. Um, and, and I think that's where we need to go. And that, when we talk about this year of care, it means so how many times does somebody need to see a physician or a nurse practitioner or a PA, uh -huh. how many times do we really think that they need to be um, helped by behavioral health? What's the dental schedule? And the linkages between these various aspects of a disaggregated healthcare system, yeah. I mean, it, the research is, has been clear, is becoming clearer. You know, the most obvious examples are cardiovascular outcomes for people who have, who have good dental care and who don't have good dental yeah. care. Maternal and child health outcomes for people who have good dental care and who don't have good dental care. Um, and um, 
I think I think we're breaking down those barriers between those disciplines so that everybody can think of themselves as someone who's working for the good and the health of the people that are in front of them. Um, that's where I think things need to go. And that's how I think we become more relational than transactional. Um, but it is, it is only by a shift in how things are paid for that that is really going to happen. Yeah. It's whole person care. Yeah. And we are on the road to that. that we are. <clears throat> uh, that destination. We haven't gotten there yet. Not, no, we have not. <clears throat> and not even, not even in Washington. I mean. Um, but you're closer. We, we are, we are, we are closer. Your we experience closer. will be crucially important to pointing the way, <clears throat> both how to do it right and how to avoid doing it wrong. Right. Well, um, we're not going to avoid doing it wrong sometimes. <laughs> but and if we'll, we didn't try, we right. never. And, and we'll luck succeed. out doing it right sometimes, and the challenge there will be remember what we did. <laughs> <laughs> In the midst of celebrating. Yeah, absolutely. Our success. Yeah. Tom Trumpeter, thank you so much. My pleasure. You're, My pleasure. You're one of the icons and heroes um, of this Health Center history story. I'm talking to another one right here in front of me. <laughs> and, you know, it's been a joy. We, we stand on the shoulders of giants, Dan. Um, and we do. Um, we are privileged to be the people that we are in the, in the positions that we're in, but we would not be here were it not for all of the folks who are really. I don't want to be trite, the wind beneath our wings. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely true. And that's the joy. And the times we live in. Mm -hmm. May we live in interesting times. <laughs> Let it not be a curse. Indeed. All Indeed. right, Tom. All right. Thanks, Thanks very Dan. much.